Hello everyone, welcome to yet another session of the daily news analysis by Sri Ram's IAS where we take up the important articles featuring in the Hindu newspaper and break them down for our understanding. Let's start today's discussion by taking the important articles from the newspaper. The important articles which feature in the newspaper we've uh, taken on our screens. Let's take up the first article. The first article reads, Supreme Court upholds powers of arrest raid under PMLA, which is the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Now, this article becomes very important with respect to the GS2 syllabus, where we study important acts with respect to the polity. So, this particular article talks about the constitutional validity of Prevention of Money Laundering Act and its amendments. So, this we'll discuss this article in the backdrop of what exactly is PMLA, what is the issue uh, regarding this act that the case went to Supreme Court and what has a Supreme Court given as its order. So, the discussion on PMLA, we'll start with understanding what is the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Now, before we go into the act, shall we understand first what exactly is money laundering? So, money laundering is a concept of washing the black money into legal or white money. That is why the word laundering. So, this is a process of earn, uh, those people who earn money in an illegal uh, way. So, the proceeds of crime or the proceeds of illegal money earning when it is converted into white money or the traces of the crime are removed from that money that is called the process of money laundering and therefore it is a very uh, heinous crime that exists which not just funds terrorist activities inside the country but all over the world and cross national crimes as well. Therefore the concept and the act of money laundering is very crucial to sustenance of all kinds of criminal and drug related activities and therefore governments all over the world are very keen on attacking and curbing this concept of money laundering. We, rem we know that there is an uh, organization called FATF, which is the Financial Action Task Force. It also takes care of the terror financing and money laundering activities that goes on on an uh, international level. And it has placed Pakistan on the grey list because it has found that Pakistan is not uh, dealing with uh, the terrorist activities properly and the terror financing in Pakistan is still going on. So, it, it placed Pakistan on the grey list. So, this is the background with respect to the money laundering. So, even India was equally committed to deal with money laundering issues and that is why it brought out the PMLA Act in 2002. So, now this act was brought to prevent obviously money laundering activities and the heinous crime which goes on to finance terror activities across the world. So, therefore this act was uh, promulgated and it forms the core of the legal framework put in place by India to combat money laundering and the provisions of this act are applicable to all financial institutions including banks, including RBI, mutual funds, insurance companies and their financial intermediaries. So, the uh, uh, in, uh, enforcement body under this act which is that body that is ED or Enforcement Directorate. Mm -hmm. So, Enforcement Directorate is the body which has been given the powers to prosecute become the prosecute uh, prosecution agency to carry out cases under this act. So, it will uh, deal with any of those cases who, uh, who the body thinks that can be suspected of the money laundering activity. So, this is the act and then the act was also amended in 2012. So, as we know this act was brought to combat the activity of money laundering and in 2012 it was amended to give even more extensive powers. What were, what, what were these powers? The, generally, we know that the burden, there is a concept of burden of proof which means that that uh, if let's say if a police officer is arresting any person who has committed a theft now th that person will be taken to court and now that uh, accused or who has been accused of theft uh, will have to uh, prove whether uh, the court will ask the accused whether or not he's committed a theft so there's a concept of burden of proof which means that the onus or the burden or the responsibility 
to prove the crime rests with one person is uh, one can either say that the accused should prove his innocence that the accused should prove that he did not commit a theft or the police officer should uh, convince the court that the accused committed the theft so this is known as burden of proof so on whom it lies is, is a very vital question when we discuss uh, legal aspects of the cases so this burden of proof generally in cases or criminal cases lies on the prosecution which means that it is the prosecution or the agency which is arresting the person it has the responsibility to prove that this person committed the crime this is known as burden of proof lying on the prosecution agency but the amendment that was made in PMLA act in 2012 said that the burden of proof is shifted to the accused which means that the police will arrest uh, or the ed in this case will arrest the person but when he or she will go to the court the burden of proving that the act was uh, not done it does not rest with the uh, ed to prove the act but it rests with the accused to prove that he did not commit the money laundering act so this became a harsher uh, uh, provision that got added into the amendment then second was extensive arrest powers and bail powers given to ed where they could arrest anyone uh, w without uh, w without formalities and they could attach the properties because uh, the most of these crimes are related to proceeds of uh, crime and money so they could attach their properties and second uh, uh, thirdly was that if in uh, generally what we see in criminal law if you give any statement in front of the police officer right it is considered as ad inadmissible what does this mean that tomorrow you get arrested and you are taken to a police station and the police officer records any statement that you give into the police station that statement would be inadmissible which means that it cannot be used against you into the court wherein tomorrow the police officer will go and say in the court that this person accepted this particular crime or thing in the police station the court will not accept it saying that that was accepted in the police station in front of you and that is not uh, admissible but in the pmla amendment it was said that any statement given in front of the ed officer would be admissible which means that any statement that uh, that the person gives in front of the enforcement director can be used against him in the court and the court will accept it so these were different and harsher or stringent provisions applied in the pmla act and why were they being done the uh, uh, the par parliament or the center promulgating these changes said that the act of money laundering is a very uh, complicated act and uh, the the money that is transferred can go off or can become uh, uh, can go out of the trace for the agencies very quickly that is why they said that such stringent amendments were uh, important to be made then obviously if you make a law so much powerful there were protests and we also see certain examples of the ed being used by the ruling government against against its political adversaries or people who uh, or, or, or on whom certain cases can be filed the data with respect to ed and pmla cases is that in the last 8 years there have been more than 2000 cases i'm not remembering the data exactly but the cases go on in thousands and there have been more than 2000 cases registered by enforcement directed against various companies and individuals and how many cases have really gotten the conviction which means that how many cases really went to the court and came till a verdict only 23 which means that in uh, in excessive number of cases are filed and only small number of cases are reached to conviction so this obviously casted a doubt whether this agency is working with respect to the law properly and the amendments that were made are they stringent more stringent or are they constitutionally valid so then this case went to the supreme court and supreme court now has given the verdict that these amendments which were made into the prevention of money laundering act are actually constitutionally valid so it has upheld the uh, uh, various provisions that we just discussed that the burden of proof which lied on the accused and not the prosecution agency the supreme court has upheld it saying that the uh, crime of money laundering is a very uh, complex complex as well as a heinous crime and that is why having such a uh, stringent provision is a valid thing to do then keeping the arrest and bail provision stringent also the supreme court has uh, upheld this provision and 
the provision on ECIR or Enforcement Case Information Report. So this is a report which can be uh, called similar to FIR. When, we, when a crime is committed and FIR is constituted in the police station and the law related to FIR is that this FIR copy should be given to the accused. But in case of PMLA again, this enforcement case information report, if the agency does not give to the accused, it is also held uh, valid that su Supreme Court held that it's valid if the uh, uh, ED or the agency which is prosecuting does not give this report to the person who's getting arrested. It might look like they are not they are being deprived of their uh, uh, of their rights, but Supreme Court said that the agency said su uh, suggesting the reasons for arrest. Therefore, it might not give the ECIR or the enforcement case information report to the person who is getting arrested and then the statement in front of the officer is inadmissible which was also upheld by Supreme Court that this unique provision which is not there in other laws of the criminal laws and it is there in the PMLA was also upheld in the Supreme Court. So this is a quite a landmark judgment which has happened with respect to the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. So from the examination point of view what becomes important for us is the important provisions of Prevention of Money Laundering Act these uh, provisions which have which have been in talks and the concept of enforcement directorate because it is a body which is in quite uh, quite in use so let's also understand about enforcement directorate how is enforcement directorate connected to pmla because enforcement directorate is the premier body which takes up and investigates cases for the prevention of money laundering act so the nodal body which will take care of investigating the cases would be the prevention of money laundering act, uh, would be the enforcement directorate so about the origin of this organization the origin of this directorate goes back to 1956 when earlier it was known as enforcement unit was formed in the department of economic affairs for handling exchange control laws violations under the foreign exchange regulation act so earlier there was an act known as FERA or Foreign Exchange Regulation Act. It was the same act which, which would deal with exchange control laws, the money that is going in and out of the country. Dealing with those laws, first there was an enforcement unit and in the year 1957, this was renamed as the Enforcement Directorate and it became a part of the Department of Revenue Ministry of Finance. So this becomes an important point to note under which ministry does enforcement directorate work. So it is the Ministry of Finance and in the Ministry of Finance in the Department of Revenue. There are various ministries at the central and state level. So various ministries have sub departments under them, right? So Ministry of Finance has various departments, Department of Expenditure, Department of Revenue. So it works under Department of Revenue, right? And it, this, this organization has premierly two laws which it, which it prosecutes under and is the nodal authority for. One we saw is the Prevention of Money Laundering Act and the other one which replaced the FERA Act of uh, 1947 is the Foreign Exchange Management Act of 1999 that is known as FEMA. Right? So these two laws are the premier laws which this agency investigates and prosecutes for. And what about the composition? Besides directly recruiting personnel, the directorate also draws officers from different investigation agencies that is the Customs and Central Excise, Income Tax, Police uh, and on deputation which means that from the various services, Indian Revenue Service, Indian Police Service, Indian Administrative Service, Customs Service, Excise Service, officers from all of these services will be recruited in the Enforcement Directorate and other functions processing cases of fugitives from India under the Fugitive Economic Offenders Act. So recently promulgated Fugitive e Economic Offenders Act after uh, of offenders like Vijay Malia, Nirav Modi fled the country, this act was promulgated to deal with the laws of Fugitive Economic Offenders. So the task of prosecuting this, uh, uh, these laws as well was given to the AD, uh, uh, right? And with respect to the prosecution, the special courts are uh, instituted for the uh, judgment of these cases where if there, there are cases re re related to PMLA, the PMLA Act uh, deals with this that it gives out a provision that any case that is to be decided for pre prevention of money laundering act will be done via special courts which means that at a session court level a special court 
would be instituted which will deal with these cases so this was the this was the discussion with respect to this topic the event that has happened and what are the important provisions for the uh, for us to know about this with this let's move on to our next article for the day the next article which appears in the newspaper reads government initiatives work on consumer spending survey now this is a very important survey which is uh, which is highlighted in the article which is the household consumption expenditure survey or what the uh, headline is saying is consumer spending survey this becomes important for us from the point of view of gs3 where we study important aspects of economy why this in, in uh, survey becomes important we'll see that so first of all what is household consumer spending survey or consumer expenditure survey is also known as basically this survey is a government conducted survey which takes care of the or which takes a survey or information about the consumption habits of the indian residents or indian masses how they are consuming what are their perceptions what are their uh, trends related to expenditure or uh, incurred by all the residents of the country so this survey gathers crucial data which will help the government and policy makers to form better policies so who takes out this survey uh, and it is taken out by the national statistical office which works under the ministry of statistics and program implementation and the body under this ministry is the nsso or national sample survey office which has now been converted in the uh, to national statistical office right so this particular body conducts the survey which works under the ministry of statistics and program implementation and this is a survey which is done every 5 years which is therefore known as quinquennial right which means that every 5 years the survey was done and the crucial part was the last survey which was done in 2018 the data of this survey could not be released by the government saying that there were certain irregularities with respect to the survey and therefore there was a lot of news and debate about about not releasing the data of the household consumption expenditure survey so this year government is preparing to uh, uh, calculate the uh, the data via the survey in a digital manner and release the data and take care of the policy measures as well so it is a survey occurring every 5 years and what does it do it collects information on the consumption spending patterns of households across the country in both urban and rural areas so this becomes a very important aspect for the government to see as to what exactly are the people of country both rural and urban areas how much how how are they indulging into consumption expenditure what are they actually spending on and the information generated reveals the average expenditure on goods food and non food and services and therefore it helps generate estimates of household monthly per capita consumer expenditure when this data is generated that is the monthly per capita consumption expenditure this is such a crucial data which can be used in a host of things calculating the gdp calculating the inflation measuring the inflation setting the base years for them it becomes used for all of these things and as well as the distribution of households and persons over the mpce classes and the significance in general is that it helps in calculating the demand dynamics of the economy what do we mean by demand dynamics when we look at the manner in which the households are spending their money would it not show a pattern as to what is what exactly are they spending on which would show us the demand for certain food items what exactly is the demand for certain food items those items which the uh, public is spending more on which would highlight higher demand for those items so the demand dynamics can be better understood by the consumption spending survey and then it helps in understanding the shifting priorities in terms of baskets of goods and services thus providing pointers to the producers of goods and providers of services this is also an important intervention let's say that earlier the households were indulging into buying of a certain uh, oil which let's say groundnut oil or soya bean oil but now the households have shifted to buying sunflower oil or if sunflower oil is not available rice bran oil this might show shifting priorities in terms of baskets of goods although buying sunflower oil is not easy right now because as we know the sunflower oil is majorly imported from ukraine and what's happening in russia ukraine we know that is why the supplies of sunflower oil have taken a big hit 
and then to assess living standards and growth trends across multiple strata. So all this is general information that can be uh, taken out from the consumption expenditure survey. And what is the significance for policy makers? The expenditure survey is an analytical as well as forecasting tool. So uh, we saw the analytical aspect where a lot of data can be analyzed and it's also a forecasting tool which means that based on the data that will be collected a lot of forecasts for the future can also be done for the government in planning required uh, interventions and policies and to spot and address possible structural anomalies that cause demand to shift in a particular manner in specific socio-economic or regional division of the population. For example, such consumption expenditure survey highlights as to whether the households are spending enough on nutrition, whether they are spending enough on health, spending enough on education. So this gives the government a fair idea on what policy interventions the government needs to make. And thirdly, as I said, to rebase. There are certain base years for these parameters such as the GDP, consumer price index. When the uh, survey calculates the data, these base years can also be shifted based on this data and these indexes also greatly benefit from the consumption expenditure survey. So the government is going to conduct this survey and as and when the data comes for this survey, we will review the data for the survey as well. But we stop here and we move with the next article for the day. The next article which appears in the newspaper reads, replacement level fertility achieved. Now this is also a very important article which appears in the newspaper which talks about the replacement level fertility which pertains to the population of the country and uh, is a concept which is important across the population of the world as well. So what is this replacement level fertility that becomes important for us from the examination point of view. So this becomes important for us from the point of view of GS1 where we study population and associated issues right. So what is replacement level fertility? So first of all let's understand about the debate about population that is going on. So recently the UN released its world population prospects report right. This was a news few weeks ago. Uh, we had also taken up in our sessions. So UN released the World Population Prospects Report wherein it said that India is set to become the highest populated country and it will soon become, soon overtake China in November 23 uh, itself. So in the year 2023, India will overtake China to become the most populous country of the world and India's population is set to be around 1.4 billion at this point of time. So the UN report is saying that India's population is on the rise and it is set to become the most populous country uh, leaving behind China in the year 2023. This was given by the UN World po uh, Population Prospects Report, right, which the UN releases and is a quite a credible report. But the important aspect in the population uh, debate is to understand is about the total fertility rate. What do we mean by the total fertility rate? Total fertility rate is the measure of the fertility rate or the number of babies that a woman is having. So the average number of babies which a woman has in her lifetime is known as the total fertility rate or TFR. Now this TFR is a very important measure because when we calculate TFR that is when we understand the trend. So the TFR for India was around 4 to 5 at the time of independence which, mean, which meant that each mother was having around 4 to 5 children in her lifetime. But this total fertility rate went on decreasing uh, as we uh, as the country started to develop. The population was still increasing uh, mammothly, but the total fertility rate started to decrease because obviously because of the family planning programs, use of contraceptives, awareness about uh, fa family planning and also the uh, rising living standards. When the living standards rise, it becomes uh, difficult to raise many kids. So all of these factors contributed to decrease of the TFR and the TFR for the uh, country, uh, for, for India started to decrease and the article is now saying that the TFR has gone below or reached 
2.1 or less than 2.1 in 31 states. Now what does this denote? This means that each mother right now is having less than 2.1 children for India. So, and why is this number significant? Because 2.1 is said to be the replacement level fertility rate. Now what does replacement level fertility rate mean? That whenever we talk about population and we say that uh, the population it is increasing but there can also come a time where if people are not reproducing enough the population would not be on an increasing positive trend but rather go on a negative trend. This is what is happening with China. What China did? We know that China for to control its uh, high rising population uh, instituted the one child policy which wherein it mandated the residents of China to have only one child. Is this below 2.1? the replacement level fertility rate. So what has started to happen right now is that China's population has no doubt stabilized but apart from being stabilized, it, stabilizing it is on the verge of negatively declining where down the line it might face decline of its population. So therefore there is a certain number which means that if the population is at that rate it would mean that the earlier set of population would be replaced by a new set of population. This rate is known as the replacement level fertility rate which means that if a mother or if a woman is having these many children and which that would mean that these many is granted as 2.1. This is a calculated figure. Does it mean that each mother will have 2.1 children? No. It is approximately 2 children and 0.1 has been given for the stillbirths that happen or the deaths of mothers that happen. So this is a mathematically calculated figure which says that if a woman is bearing 2.1 or average 2 children, it would the replacement level for the population would be reached which, which would mean that whatever population is there at this point of time would be replaced by a new set of population. So this would uh, showcase the stability of the population in a country. And what has the data for India telling us right now? That India has reached the TFR or the total fertility rate for India has reached the replacement level fertility rate. So this is a good information, this is a positive information and this also busts certain myths for India which talks about the rising population where right now we need not think about uh, the increasing population because the population is already stabilizing. What we need to think about is how, how to cater to this existing population with the uh, important interventions in infrastructure, health, education. How do we make sure that the existing population has in enough health and infrastructure and education and the demographic dividend, what we call as the age, the population between the age group of 15 to 64. For India, it is said that around 60% of India's population is in the age 15 to 64 which means that the demographic dividend for India is quite high and this is the time which is very crucial for India to utilize this, uh, this demographic dividend and to utilize this demographic, demographic dividend we need high employment, increase education and increase the health facility for the residents. So in this uh, article the Union Health Secretary Rajesh Bhushan mentions that the family planning program in India was now over seven decades old and in this period the country has witnessed a paradigm shift from the concept of population control where which we started to population stabilization and to interventions being embedded toward ensuring harmony of continuum care wherein the health secretary is highlighting that from population control we have now moved on to population stabilization and with this we need to ensure that whichever uh, population is existing right now it, it uh, keeps getting continued care and we harness this demographic dividend. So this is the information with respect to this article the important concepts of TFR replacement fertility rate and what do we make out of this information right. So with this we move on to our next article for the day. The next article which appears in the newspaper reads the forest rights act well begun and ready for the home run. Now this particular headline highlights the performance of the state of Odisha in implementing the Forest Rights Act where other states in the country are lagging behind in their implementation of the Forest Rights Act. The uh, article highlights that Odisha has reached to near completion of its uh, implementation of the act and it has decided that by the year 2024 
by the year 2024 it would have uh, completely enacted the forest rights act so with in this respect the forest rights act become very important for us and it has already been asked in the examination so let's see what question has been asked in the examination with respect to the forest rights act so what does it say under the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers that is recognition of forest rights act this act is shortly known as the forest rights act who shall be the authority to initiate the process for determining the nature and extent of individual or community forest rights or both so this is what the question uh, asked whether who is the authority which is responsible for determining the rights of these forest dwelling communities about uh, either individual or community rights so the four options were given we'll discuss the answer to this question in a short while so now what becomes important for us uh, from here is to understand the forest rights act so what exactly is the forest rights act the forest rights act was basically instituted to protect the interests of the forest dwelling communities the forest dwelling communities or the tribal communities were historically exploited since the time of the british where the british wanted to exploit the resources of the forest and in doing so they completely neglected the role of the tribals and forest dwelling communities who lived in the forest flourished in the forest and also took care of the forest resources so there is a harmonious relationship between the forest communities and the forests which exist in, uh, which exist in and around the country and the world as well so recognizing this the government instituted the forest rights act in order to grant the rights which were taken away from these forest dwelling communities these rights should be given back to them so, and to do this to bring out a balance between the rights of the forest dwelling communities and the usage of forest resources in order to strike a balance the forest rights act was instituted so there's a symbiotic relationship between the forests and the forest dwelling communities found which found recognition in the national forest policy of 1988 which was earlier recognized but the act which was formulated for this came out as the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers that is recognition of the forest rights act which came out in 2006 and was enacted right and it aimed to protect the marginalized socio-economic class of citizens and balance the right to environment with their right to life and livelihood so this was the basic objective of the act which tried to grant the rights to the tribal communities which were taken away via decades of exploitation that happened so what were the important provisions of the uh, forest rights act and before that why are these forest rights important for these forest tribals as we saw that they were exploited against this aimed at undoing the historic injustice meted out upon the forest dependent communities due to curtailment of their customary rights the fra came into force in 2008 which means which meant that the act came into uh, uh, was enacted in the year 2006 and all the provisions came into force by the year 2008 it is important as it recognizes the community's right to use so the distinct feature of this act is that it has two kinds of right, rights one is the individual right and one is the collective right now how are these two rights different there can be a right to own a land or in the forest which is individual which means that an individual owns a track of land but there are there is a concept of collective rights as well which is very popular in the tribal culture that a piece of land is owned collectively by the community so this right recognizes the concept of individual rights as well as collective rights to use manage and conserve forest resources and to legally hold forest land that these communities have used for cultivation and residence and it also underlines the integral role that the forest dwellers play in the sustainability of forests and in the conservation of biodiversity that is why odisha has paid attention to this implementation of this act where it has completed 90 percent implementation and it gave special budgetary allocation to this act around 8000 crore was given by the odisha government to this to the implementation of this act and it is of greater significance inside protected forests like the national parks sanctuaries and the tiger reserves as traditional dwellers then become a part of the management of the protected forest so this is what is being done via the act and how does this act do so let's understand so what are the important provisions so first of all the rights under the act now there are various kinds of rights there are title rights which means that 
any part of the land which is there in the forest a title can be granted over that land title would mean title of ownership that certain rights would be given to individual either individually or collectively which would mean that that land is owned by these people either an individual or collectively those are known as title rights then there are use rights which mean which would mean that certain uh, tribal communities or individuals do not have the ownership of the land but have the right to use that land these kind of rights are known as use rights and then there are relief and development rights which would mean that these communities can carry out development works uh, or cultivation works over these lands and there is the forest management rights to protect forests and wildlife which would mean that certain rights would be given to these forest communities and certain officials as well to take care of the forest management so these are the important rights that are enshrined in the uh, in the forest rights act and the important uh, uh, aspect which this act carries is to grant these rights to forest dwelling communities so who takes care of this process this process is instituted at the gram sabha level so the gram sabha which is there at the village uh, would be the body where, wherein let's say if certain community or certain forest dwelling individual wants his or her right to get recognized so they would go to the gram sabha they would submit their application that we want this right to be recognized we want this uh, th this land belong to us this application will go to the gram sabha the gram sabha will first decide at its level to uh, on the on this application and then it would be sent to the taluka and the district level which would be uh, uh, reviewed by a screening committee which is also again instituted under the act and government officials will head the screening committee with representation from the gram sabha members so this is the uh, path breaking aspect of uh, forest rights act which grants the powers of granting rights to the forest dwelling communities at the level of gram sabha this was an important fact that is why it was asked in the exam which asked that which is the authority to initiate not decide initiate the process of determining the nature and extent of the individual or community forest rights or both so what would be the answer to this gram sabha right so this is the discussion with respect to forest rights act what is the speciality of it what were the objectives what are the important provisions and how is odisha doing well so this uh, we end today's discussion here and we'll meet again tomorrow with the important articles thank you